With the election behind us, we continue our series, Issues That Matter, to explore the challenges facing our country. This morning, we are looking at national security with former Defense Secretary Robert Gates. In September, Gates voiced serious concerns about Donald Trump in a Wall Street Journal opinion piece. He wrote, at least on national security, I believe Mr. Trump is beyond repair. Gates added he is unqualified and unfit to be Commander-in-Chief. Secretary Gates joins us now for his first interview since the election. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so how do you see him now since we have seen an op looked at him as president-elect? You know, I wrote that op-ed based on the statements that have been made in the campaign about our allies, <clears throat> about NATO, about nuclear weapons in Japan and Korea, uh, about China and Russia, about our troops, about our generals. And I must say, um, I think that... Uh, based on what I've seen since the election on these issues, um, I'm hoping I was wrong. And you know people that are talking to him as well. And I know a lot of the people that have, he's talking to. Uh, I've talked to a lot of them, and I've encouraged them to serve. I, it's, it's critical for us now that he is president-elect for him to be successful as president, especially in national security. It's important for us all. So I think anybody who can do anything to help should do it. And those who want to stand on the sidelines, I would urge them to reconsider. What have you seen that is encouraging to you? Well, I think, first of all, I think some of the people that he's talking to uh, for senior jobs I find uh, very encouraging. Uh, they're, they're very solid people. Uh, you know, I don't want to jinx anybody's chances, but for example, uh, General Mattis, um, if he were to become Secretary of Defense, he would be the first senior military officer to, retired military officer to play that role since George Marshall. Uh, in right the after World War II. Mm -hmm. And I would ordinarily have some concerns about civilian military relationships and civilian control and so on, but not with Jim Mattis. Jim has a, a deep uh, sense of history. He's got a great strategic mind and, and the, the folks in uniform love him. I, I think he would be a great choice. U.S. law actually prohibits um, a member of a commissioned officer from serving as Secretary of Defense within seven years. So how would uh, President like Trump get around that? The Congress can pass a waiver and and I think if if there were if, if he had the strong support as he appears to of John McCain the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee I think I think getting that waiver would probably be more of a formality than a problem. It's so great to have you here because you've served seven presidents. Repu eight. Eight, eight presidents, excuse me, yes. <laughs> Democrats and Republicans so you have seen how both uh, both parties uh, work in this situation. There's a general as a national security advisor, potentially a general as secretary of defense, and a former general if Petraeus is chosen as secretary of state. Is that too many generals? Well, I think it would be very difficult to have former generals as both secretary of state and secretary of defense. Um, and, you know, the president will obviously have to make his own choices. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think, um, I think that is... Uh, probably too much military influence in the in the decision making process. Yeah. Um, I have the highest regard for and worked closely with General yeah. Petraeus, with uh, with General Mattis, General Kelly is being mentioned for possible yeah. positions. Mm -hmm. I think all three of them are amazing, terrific people. Um, but I think it would be I think it would be uh, awkward to have. A military officer is both Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense. Let's talk about issues. Russia, for example, uh, you are a longtime student of Russia as well as the important positions you've held. Uh, what should be the president elect's uh, approach and strategy and policy towards Russia? I think the president has to thread the needle between trying to break the downward spiral of the relationship with Russia that's been going on for the last couple of years and at the same time send the message to Putin that the United States can't be pushed around and that uh, we will react and act to uh, protect our interests but but I think I think there does need to be an initiative to try and figure out how we break this spiral. Have we sent a message that we can be pushed around by Russia? I think that I think that what has happened in Syria, what has happened in Ukraine, uh, and and the reactions. I think I think outside observers would say that the Russians uh, 
uh, have us on our back foot in terms of what to do uh, about their behavior and their activities in these areas. What does that mean the Russians have us on, their, on, the, on our back foot? Well, at a disadvantage that, that they have seized the initiative, uh, for example, in Syria. Mm -hmm. um, and so if there's an outside power that's calling the shots, if you will, in Syria right now, it's Russia, not us. And, and, and they're pushing in Europe as well. Pushing in Europe. Uh, you know, these stories about uh, trying to bring about a coup in Montenegro yeah. and uh, the activities pushing against the uh, Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, and so on. And the German intelligence chief said this morning that he's concerned they may try to tamper with German elections. Yeah, well, and then there's the whole... Uh, internet cyber problem affecting our election right. mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, perhaps the Brexit vote in Russia. And, I mean, Can we Britain talk about ISIS? Donald Trump has said that he will defeat ISIS, but he has not yet presented a plan on how to do so. How do you characterize the fight against ISIS right now? What needs to be done? I think that I think what we're doing now is what we ought to be doing, but we ought to have been doing it two years ago. Which is? Uh, and that is a very aggressive air campaign um, at close-in advisors helping uh, our different partners, the Sunni tribes, the Kurds, the Iraqi security forces, um, ample use of special forces. I think all of these things together are, uh, as a package, are the right things to be doing. Can we be more aggressive in one or another of those? Perhaps. But I think the basic outlines of, of what we're doing is what we should be doing. This fight, we do not want to put uh, large numbers of American troops back in Iraq. What does and large numbers not. mean? Because there has been an increase of American presence on the ground. Yeah, we're, we're I think, back up over 5,000 uh, or so, somewhere between five and 6,000. But, but to, to dominate the situation on the ground would be... 10, 15, 20,000, and nobody wants to do that. To know what you thought before this election, you, you thought the Iran deal uh, was not perfect, but my impression is you supported it. I thought we could have gotten a better deal, particularly on verification. The administration said we needed any time, any place inspections, and we didn't get it. So John Brennan uh, talked to the BBC and basically uh, British media and basically said it would be a height of folly for Donald Trump to void that agreement. I think it would be a mistake to tear up the agreement at this point. I think we would be the ones isolated, not the Iranians, because none of our other partners that helped that negotiate that would walk away from it. But I do think what the new president can do is push back against the Iranians in all of the other acts. In the behavior acts. In their behavior in the region and, you know, pointing guns at our helicopters and challenging our ships and they're meddling in Yemen and they're meddling in uh, Syria and having significant troops. We should have, from the very beginning, made it clear that we were not going to allow that the agreement on nuclear materials was not going to inhibit us in the slightest from protecting our friends and our interests in that region against, Iran against the Iranians. Yeah. Uh, the irony is the Ayatollah made it clear they were not going to be inhibited from doing other things in the region. I don't know why the president didn't provide that same kind of pushback. It seems to me that on, on China, on Russia, uh, on Iran, you're basically saying we have to make sure that people feel our presence and do not push us around and that we are, in fact, going to stand for what we believe in. Absolutely. But I do think there are lots of ways to do that without sending significant numbers of American troops around the world. I think that this sense that... We're, we've been at war for 15 years. We have, we have used the military tool in the national security toolbox to the exclusion of almost everything else. And so I think we can make our presence and our influence known not, not only by the deterrent effect of military strength, but then by supplementing it with diplomacy and intelligence activities and so on. And I just think there's been too much of an emphasis on putting troops on the ground uh, around the world. Secretary Gates, we have to leave it there. It's called Issues That Matter. That's why we like having you at the table. Thank you. Thank I you. That's what matters. Thank you, sir.